Hello everyone. In this video, we are going to discuss about the repeated or important questions from the IGCSC Biology 9 to 1. So this, in this video, I'm going to discuss about the list of questions that I think are important and might appear in your November exams. So I have prepared a slide with the questions and also arranged their mark scheme points. And in this video, I'm going to discuss about the uh, why the Pearson at Excel has referred these mark scheme point and also explain you the questions. So let's get started. Question number one, explain why lactic acid builds up in the muscles after running. So let us first understand the uh, state of situations that happen during and after running. So whenever we are exercising, our body cannot breathe in enough so there is a situation when our body doesn't get enough oxygen but it needs to respire for the muscle contraction so at a point due to lack of oxygen our body cannot respire aerobically then it shifts to anaerobic respiration so anaerobic respiration here is a mark skin point and as a product of anaerobic respiration it will obviously release two ATP molecules and these energy molecules and or anaerobic respiration provides the energy for the muscle contraction during exercise but also a byproduct of anaerobic respiration is lactic acid and that keeps on uh, releasing into the muscle cells as the muscle cells will respire anaerobically the entire lactic acid builds up because lactic acid is a very huge molecule and we cannot just wash it off from the muscles you need to break it down again using oxygen so that's why during respiration as oxygen availability is still low the lactic acid cannot be broken down so thus they keep on building into the muscle so i hope question number one was clear Moving to question number two, explain why muscles becomes fatigue after exercise. So fatigue means tired. Again, these are the same points that during exercise, our body doesn't get enough oxygen. So there is a state of lack of oxygen. And these lack of oxygen kind of forces the muscle cells to respire anaerobically and anaerobically uh, there is still a benefit of anaer uh, respiring anaerobically because they also release energy but compared to aerobic respiration less energy is produced so we can write less energy is produced and this energy is used for the muscle contraction during the exercise now again as a byproduct of anaerobic respiration lactic acid will be produced and lactic acids build this and uh, lactic acids will keep on building into the muscles and these lactic acids cannot be broken down without the presence of oxygen so even after the exercise the deep breathing session continues because these lactic acids need to be broken down the lactic acid that was produced during the anaerobic respiration and and has a for and has form a store of lactic acid in the muscles that lactic acid needs to be broken down so that's why the deep breathing session continues even after exercise and again uh, the tiredness comes from the anaerobic respiration tiredness means we are not getting enough energy to our energy requirement so that's why the person feels tired after exercise because there is no energy stored in them or the energy stored in them is very low so that's why they feel tired or fatigue i hope question number three was clear state differences between eukaryotic and prokaryotic organisms you mean uh, we know that eukaryotic organisms have double membrane bound organelles so they have this uh, or um, double membrane bound organelles like mitochondria chloroplast prokaryotes doesn't have these and then eukaryotes have a nucleus prokaryotes doesn't have any nucleus eukaryotes have um, G chromosomes I mean, uh, every eukaryote and every prokaryote will have their genetic materials but eukaryotes have their genetic materials in the form of chromosomes and prokaryotes have their genetic materials in the form of loop of dna and eukaryotes doesn't have any plasmids whereas prokaryotes have plasmids so lack of plasmids so these are the points you can write your answer using these points for the difference between eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells. I hope 3 is clear. Moving to 4. Test for the presence of fats in food. This is a very common question. So in order to test for the presence of fat in a food, we need to first crush the food because crushing increases the surface area 
so this increases the surface area and then we need to add ethanol and some water to this crushed fruit and then the solutions and entire solution to be stirred so an entire concentrated equally sprayed solution is formed and after the solution is con uh, formed if we see white emulsion or white droplets onto the surface of the solution the white surface or white uh, droplets indicates the presence of fat in that food so what are we doing here we are first crushing the food and then adding ethanol with water into that crushed food and then the formation of white emulsions or small droplets onto the surface of the solution indicates the presence of fat in food so i hope question number four was clear moving to question number five explain the role of uh, fibers in diet so there has to be a dye in in this space so explain the role of fibers in diet now we know that fibers are undigestible materials so we have to like start your answer with this point because this is also mark skim point undigested material and as they are undigestible materials so why are we still continue in eating the, those things there is a reason behind it and that is these undigestible material helps in the peristalsis and what is peristalsis? It is basically the, basically the movement of food along the entire intestine. And it also prevents constipation or causes a better bowel movement. So these are the points that you need to arrange your answers with. So I hope question number 5 was clear. Moving to question number 6. State what is meant by the term catalyst. We know catalyst is any type of chemical or any kind, any kind of substance that speeds up a chemical reaction without being itself changed at the end of the reaction. So these are the terms that you can use to write your answer for catalyst. So the chemical answer, uh, sorry, the mark skim point is substance that speeds up chemical reactions. And then part two is what is meant by the term metabolic. We know metabolic means any kind of chemical reaction that is occurring inside living cells or that is occurring inside the entire living organism. Those chemical reactions are referred to as metabolic reactions. So this is the mark skim point, chemical reactions or processes inside cells, cytoplasm, body or organism. So you can write your answer using these mark skim points. Then moving to question number seven. Explain how increasing the temperature can result in an increase in plant growth. So, um, like, obviously, how increasing a temperature can cause plant growth is basically that entire plant growth depends on one molecule, that is starch, and starch is made by photosynthesis. Now, photosynthesis is a series of reactions that is controlled by multiple enzymes, and enzymes will obviously have their optimum temperature where they would react at their maximum rate. So whenever we are increasing the temperature, it indicates that we are providing higher energy for the enzymes. And due to this increase in temperature, enzymes reach their optimum temperature because they get increased or their kinetic energy increases because of this increase in temperature. And as enzymes are now in their optimum temperature, they will interact more or they will cause the reaction, they will entirely perform at their maximum rate and when enzymes are performing at their maximum rate it indicates that they will produce they will photosynthesize more the rate of photosynthesis will increase and uh, if rate of photosynthesis increases it indicates more starch will be produced and these starch are then used for the plant growth i hope question number seven was clear moving to question number eight state the uses of nitrate and magnesium we know nitrate is needed for the formation of amino acids which are then needed for the formation of protein and magnesium is needed for the formation of chloroplast a green pigment that is found in the chlorophyll and this chlorophyll is very responsible for photosynthesis because this is the entire compound that traps sunlight and also the in entire initial stages of photosynthesis occur inside the chloroplast. So that's why the formation of chloroplasts is very important for plant cells. Question number 8 is done. Moving to question number 9. Discuss why some farmers limit the amount of chemical fertilizers they add to their crops. So the first thing, there, there are actually different reasons. There are multiple reasons behind this entire motive. So the first thing that comes to my mind is that obviously the eutrophication 
effect. If we are using excess chemicals on our land, that means obviously th there will be weather change and raining will occur. And whenever it rains, the entire chemical fertilizers will leach off to the nearest rivers, causing the eutroph eutrophication effect. Now the eutrophication effect is basically when the fertilizers leach off to the rivers fertilizers are very are chemicals that are rich in nitrates now when these nitrates move on to the rivers the river surface will have a algae bloom because algae grow at a higher rate if there is nitrate available so as the nitrates leach off to the river so the river nitrate concentration in river increases causing it a very making it a very suitable place for algae to grow now as the entire surface of the algae is covered entire surface of the river is covered by algae the algae will respire using oxygen from the river thus reducing the oxygen concentration of river so this is one point that entire uh, leaching occurs at uh, this point that washes into the nearest rivers and then causes of eutrophication which is basically algae blooming and then the algae is respire using the oxygen from the water and even after their death after the algae is die decomposers will uh, decompose the algae again using oxygen from the water so all these entire algae when they are alive they are respiring using the oxygen from the water and when they are dead decomposers are feeding on algae on dead algae using the oxygen from the river so all these algae thing basically reduces the oxygen concentration of the river that means the aquatic animals and plants will not get enough or sufficient oxygen they need to respire thus causing loss of aquatic life it could be fish or water or uh, plants so these are the one point or one uh, series that you can write your answer with that entire cause for eutrophication now there is other point that is whenever we are using the chemical fertilizers chemical fertilizers actually increases the soil concentration but reduces the water potential of the soil now how the roots absorb water from the soil because there is a imbalance of water like water molecules or water potential in the soil is higher than in the roots that's why water move into the root through osmosis now if we are using huge amount of chemical fertilizers in the soil that means the water potential of the soil will be less than the water potential of the roots now it indicates that osmosis cannot occur because the first rule for osmosis was water will move from higher concentration to lower concentration. And now due to using high or huge number of chemical fertilizers, we have decreased our water potential for the soil. Now the water potential for the soil is very less compared to the water potential of the roots and thus the plant cannot move in, the water cannot move into the roots. And obviously, it will make the plants go wilt or their leaves will get curved due, uh, in order to decrease their transpiration rates. So that's why plants wilt. So these are the, again, a series of mark skim point. You can also write your answer in terms of this uh, water potential differences or the eutrophication effect. I hope question number 9 was clear. Moving to question number 10. Explain the role of bile in digestion. We know that bile is basically an uh, entire uh, juice comes from the pancreas and entire thing neutralizes the acid from the stomach. So it basically has multiple effects that first one is it neutralizes the acid which comes from the stomach and it also as it neutralizes the acid it provides an optimum pH for the enzymes like lipase to act on fats and produce small droplets or di digest the fats so first function is it neutralizes the acid from stomach and the second one is it provides an optimum pH for enzymes like lipase to emulsify fat and produce small droplets and uh, why producing small droplet is a very beneficial thing because small droplets means that now they have increased surface area so now fats can be digested more easily i hope question number 10 was clear moving to question number 11 
explain the role of lymphocytes in the immune system so we know that lymphocytes are basically a type of white blood cell and their main function is to produce antibodies now they do not produce random antibodies the antibodies that lymphocytes produce are always specific to the antigens found on the surface of the pathogen so what they do is the they release antibodies and these antibodies then bind with the specific antigen on the surface of the pathogen and after the binding they keep on climbing the pathogens together like not climbing clumping the pathogens together and this clumping destroys the entire pathogen now in this way they protect the body from the primary attack and again if this same kind of pathogen attracts your body for the second time they also create memory cells for that memory cells remember the type of antibodies that is needed to uh, kill this kind of pathogens so whenever these pathogens enter your body for the second time the memory cells come in actions and produce antibodies to kill those bacteria then so the entire these lymphocytes produce memory cell which causes the entire secondary response to be very fast and effective so these are the entire points for lymphocytes and how they are uh, how they play a role in the entire immune response i hope question number 11 was clear moving to question number 12 explain what happens to the bacteria after they have been ingested by phagocytes so ingested means here that it is engulfed after the engulfing of phagocytes what happens to the bacteria then so let me draw a diagram so here the entire phago phagocyte and inside that there is a pathogen inside a vacuole now the entire vacuole containing the pathogen will be fused with another sac containing heterolytic enzymes now these heterolytic enzymes in the sac will move to the entire vacuole containing the pathogen and then this entire sac will fuse with the vacuole creating an opening and through this opening the enzymes heterolytic enzymes will enter the entire vacuole containing the pathogen so then the heterolytic enzymes like this you can write any uh, like just enzyme or you can uh, write the name of the enzyme that is the heterolytic enzyme so this enzymes then kill the bacteria they kill the bacteria mostly by destroying or uh, digesting them breaking them down and after the digestion the final products are absorbed by the phagocyte so these are the series of actions that occur after the phagocyte has successfully engulfed the pathogen moving to question number 13 describe what happens to the structures in ovary after fertilization we know after the entire fertilization process is done the entire ovary will become the seed the ovule wall will become the seed coat and the ovule becomes the seed itself so these are the changes that occur after fertilization question number 14 describe the role of stomach now stomach also have uh, this entire purpose of its own self that is it secretes hydrochloric acid this hydrochloric acid has two functions one that it provides an optimum ph for enzymes like pepsin to digest amino acids or so to digest protein and produce amino acid the hcl also provides the as they are at the end of the day acid they will kill any kind of bacteria that was present in the food making it less uh making it less chances that our entire digestive system will be um attacked by any kind of bacteria because the entire hcl kills most of the bacteria that we engulf during uh eating with our food so its uh, entire stomach secretes hcl hcl has two purposes one purpose of hcl is that it provides optimum ph for the proteins for the enzymes like protease which digests protein and produces amino acid and another function of hcl is that it kills any kind of pathogen that we have engulfed with our food so with this question number 14 ends moving to question number 15 explain how heart disease can affect a person's health so uh, we need to relate all these things together that how including a heart disease causes the entire health disruption so first how heart disease actually develops we need to start from the base the 
main cause for heart disease is that formation of cholesterol or fatty deposit into the artery walls now this formation of fatty deposit or cholesterol on the artery walls indicates that the entire artery might get blocked due to this entire cholesterol or fat molecules now after this entire coronary artery is blocked the heart muscles will not receive enough oxygen and even though the heart muscles are myogenic they are at the end of the day muscle cells right so they need to respire for which they need oxygen and if the entire blood supply is blocked because of this formation of cholesterol and fatty acid that means the heart muscles cannot get enough oxygen and due to lack of oxygen they cannot respire enough to produce enough energy for the muscle contraction for the heart beats therefore at a point they will not respire at all and causing the heart to stop beating and that would lead to heart attacks or even death so these are the series of changes that occur uh, or that causes the heart disease and how the heart disease the in entire causes or, or affects a person's health i hope question number 15 was clear moving to question number 16 explain why gas exchange is possible at the alveolus so these are basically the adaptations that why are the alveolus or how the alveolus is adapted for the entire gas exchange process so the gas exchange process is that the alveoli have very thin wall or we can consider it as one cell thick wall which decreases the diffusion distance also the cap alveoli are surrounded by huge network of blood capillaries so and uh, entire huge network of blood capillaries again increases the surface area now both surface area and diffusion distance increases the rate of diffusion a higher surface area provided by the capillary of network and a smaller diffusion distance provided by the one cell thick wall of the alveolus these two factors increases the rate of diffusion and another one factor of diffusion is that entire molecules need to move down the concentration gradient and down the concentration gradient is also maintained into the blood of the capillaries and alveoli because oxygen is present in high concentration into the alveoli and in low concentration into the capillaries into the capillary blood so obviously oxygen can easily diffuse out of the alveoli and enter the blood of the capillaries and again the carbon dioxide is present at high concentration inside the blood of the capillary and lower concentration into the alveolis so obviously the carbon dioxide can diffuse down the concentration gradient and enter the alveoli so these are the points that you need to you need to write your answers with so question number 16 is done moving to 17 explain how resistance to an antibiotic occurs and increases in a population of bacteria so we know that bacteria are organisms that can reproduce within a very short time they can reproduce a huge amount in a huge amount within a very short time so as they have high reproduction rate that means they will also have high mutation rate and due to this mutation there is a chance that some kind of alleles might get mutated and a certain type of bacteria might get resistance to the antibiotic now this resistant bacteria will obviously survive because it has the advantageous allele and as they are going to survive they will obviously reproduce and after the reproduction they will pass on to their entire advantageous allele to their next generation and after every reproduction this advantageous allele keep on uh, passing on keep passing on to their next generations thus after certain generations the entire population of bacteria might get resistance to bacteria antibiotics so i hope question number 17 was clear moving to question number 18 describe how saprotrophs cause decomposition we know saprotrophs are fungus or bacteria so how they cause decomposition is basically saprotrophs feed on dead organisms they secrete extracellular enzymes onto the dead organisms and these extracellular enzymes then digest the dead organisms and the digested products are then absorbed by the saprotrophs so this is how the entire decomposition is occurring moving to question number 19 explain why all the energy is not transferred to the next trophic level because not all the energy is bet, uh, is getting 
uh, available for the next trophic level because some of the energy is used by the entire organism for their own movement, for their own excretion, for their own uh, respiration. All these requires energy. So that's why if I am eating, so for example, if a plant, cabbage, if cabbage is uh, making something for its own, then I will only get one tenth of that entire energy that the cabbage has made because some of the energy will be used by the cabbage for its own respiration, for its own movement, for its own excretion. And after that, the leftover energy is transferred to the next trophic level. And again, I'm not going to eat every part of the food. So the parts of the food that I'm going to discard will contain some energy. And discarding that part of the food means that I'm discarding some part of the energy, some portion of energy. So again, for that reason, not all energy is, is transferred to the next trophic level. And again, another reason is that all the parts that I eat, all the parts of the food that I eat are not digestible. For example, cellulose. I eat leaves a lot, but even at the den end, end, end of the day, the cellulose will not be digestible. So again, the cellulose also contains some energy, but I cannot extract the energies from the cellulose. So again, some of the energy is wasted in the form of food that I eat, but still cannot digest. So I hope question number 19 was clear. Moving to question number 20. Explain the changes that occur in the structure of the eye that allow light from the distant object to be focused on the fovea. So obviously whenever we are focusing on an object that is very far away from us, we need to uh, extend our pupil, the pupil must, must expand. So this happens by a series of actions. First one is that ciliary muscles relax and suspensory ligaments contract. And this change in the muscle contraction relaxation causes the shape of the lens to be changed. Now, due to the relaxation of ciliary muscles and contraction of suspensory ligaments, the lens becomes less curved and more thick. This causes the entire light to be reflected less. The entire less curving of the lens and getting it more thick causes the refraction of light inside the eye to decrease. And also our pupil dilates, expands, so that more light rays can enter into the eye. So these are the series of actions that occur inside the eye in order to focus on a distance object. So question number 21. Describe the genetic control of most phenotypic features. We know phenotypic features are not, respond, uh, are not a result for a single gene. They are a result for many genes. So that's why we need to first write the word polygenic. Phenotypic features are polygenic as they are controlled by multiple or many genes. So each gene has a very small effect onto the entire polygenic feature. So every gene has a very small effect onto the entire polygenic feature. Question number 22. Explain how diets with less carbs and lipids can result in a reduction in body mass. So obviously... Carbs and lipids are mainly the energy providing molecule, are the food molecules that provide the highest amount of energy. And if we are reducing the amount of carbs and lipid intake, that means uh, less energy, we are putting less energy inside us, which means energy intake is less than energy use. And as the energy intake is less than the energy requirement, our body will indirectly find another way to meet for the energy sufficient requirement. And that way is that they produce or they try to respire onto the stored fat or carbohydrate in our body in order to provide enough energy that their requirement is for their requirement. So that's why whenever we are respiring onto the stored carbohydrate or fat, the entire body mass or BMI would decrease. Question number 22. Explain why diets are more effective at reducing BMI if combined with regular sugar. Regular exercise, sorry, regular exercise. So obviously, as we are already controlling our diet, that means energy intake is less than energy output. And again, this energy intake is less than energy output means that our body will respire onto the stored fat. And if we still want to reduce the amount of stored fat in our body at a higher rate, we can obviously introduce exercise. Exercise causes 
muscle contraction this muscle contraction needs energy and this energy is provided by the respiration and this respiration means as we already have less energy intake that means this respiration will occur with using the stored fat from our body and again successfully decreasing the BMI I hope question number 23 was clear Question number 24. Describe how the plasmid is modified to contain recombinant DNA. So at first we are going to obviously name all the enzymes that are in needed for the entire procedure. The first enzyme needed is restriction enzyme. Restriction enzyme cut the DNA or the sequence or the entire piece of DNA that need to be copied from the entire chromosome molecule or DNA molecule. And after the cutting, the restriction enzyme cuts the DNA in such a way so that it creates a sticky ends. And then the plasmid is combined with the DNA with, by sticking the sticky ends together. And after this, entire plasmid is uh, made, uh, entire thing. Now, this entire sticking of plasmid with the cut in a broken part of DNA, with a small piece of DNA, is done by another enzyme that is DNA ligase or ligase. So, so ligase join the or stick down the plasmid and the section of DNA together. After the entire uh, joining of DNA and plasmid is done, the recombinant plasmid is then inserted into any kind of vectors that, that could be a virus, a bacteria, mostly E. coli is used. So any kind of pathogen or any kind of microorganism is used as a vector as the entire plasmid, modified plasmid are then inserted into them. So this is how you can make recombinant DNA. Question number 25, taste for proteins. We know the entire procedure that is we have to take a small sample of the food that we suspect could have protein into a test, test tube. So we are first taking a small sample of the food into a test tube and then add Birrett's region with it. And after that, we need to warm the entire solution. And uh, do, after this warming solution, if the entire solution turns purple, the purple color indicates the presence of protein into the original food sample. So this is it. Question number 50, 25 is done. Moving to question number 26, milk is used to make yogurt, name the carbohydrate in milk used to make yogurt. We know the carbohydrate uh, used to make yogurt is lactose, the name the bacteria added to milk make, um, sorry, name the bacteria added to milk to make yogurt, we know it is lactobacillus and part 3, explain why milk needs to be heated to a high, treat, high temperature at the start of the process for making yogurt so the entire making yogurt part is that at first the milk need to be treated at high temperature so that at high temperature it kills all the type of pathogens that might be present inside the milk so in order to sterilize the milk as it kills all the bacteria present inside the milk now this killing the bacteria has two function first there won't be any food poison after the yogurt is made because of this presence of unnecessary unwanted bacteria and again the other point is that these bacteria if the other bacteria are killed that means there will be less competition for our desired bacteria that is lactobacillus so again uh, it prevents cons uh, prevents competition for lactobacillus and sterilizes the milk uh, also causes also kills the bacteria that might cause food poison so these are the points for part 3. I hope it was clear enough. Question number 27. Describe other causes of variation in offspring. So variation in offspring means that the changes that occur from the parent to the entire offspring. So this variation occurs obviously due to random mating. The entire uh, process is very random. We do not know which sperm is going to fertilize which egg. So that's why there is a chance of random mating. And again, there is a random fertilization and after the random fertilization, these are the internal processes. And again, after the fertilization, there could be a chance of mutation, which would obviously cause variations. And after all these internal chances of variation, there are also some external factors that affect the variation or, or that might uh, promote the variation in offspring, that is the environment. Environment, society, all these factors also affect or also is a very big reason for 
variation in offsprings. So that's why uh, these are the points you need to write your answer with. Question number 27 is done. Moving to question number 28. Explain the role of the neurons in the withdrawal reflex of a finger from a hot object. So we know that whenever we touch the hot object, the entire uh, state is changed uh, is received by as a stimuli to the sensory neuron the sensory neuron then pass on to this uh, stimuli to the relay neuron and the relay neuron then synapses with the motor neuron and motor neuron then produces an impulse to the effector or muscles and the effector then withdraws the hand from from the hot object so the series of actions here that is being done is sensory neuron passing the stimulus to the relay neuron and relay neuron then synapses with the motor neuron and motor neuron then transfers these impulse to the effectors or muscles and the muscle then contracts to remove its to remove itself from the hot object so this is the answer for question number 28 question number 29 explain the function of these mitochondria these mitochondria means the mitochondria in sperm explain the function of these mitochondria in sperm so the for the entire motive of mitochondria inside sperm is that mitochondria is a site for on which respiration occurs and respiration is a process that releases chemical that releases energy in the form of atp molecules right now sperm is the only molecule that needs to move towards the egg in order in order to fertilization to occur so again for the sperm to move, for the tail movement, for the swimming action, energy is needed and this energy is provided by respiration and this respiration provides energy and this respiration occurs inside the mitochondria of sperm cells. Question number 21, I hope it's clear. So 29, moving to 30, suggest the function of the acrosome. So we know acrosome is basically a sac containing heterolytic enzymes. So during fertilization, the acrosome first fuses with the egg cell membrane. And then after fusing with the egg cell membrane, it creates an opening. And this opening creates a pathway for the male nucleus to get transferred inside the egg and then fuse with the female nucleus. So entire fertilization process is started with this acrosome because acrosome fuses with the cell surface membrane of the egg and, few, uh, and uh, creates an opening through which the male nucleus can, transfer, can get transferred or enter into the egg cell and then fuse with the female nucleus and the entire fertilization process is done after that. So question number 30 is done. Moving to question number 31, describe the process that converts light energy into chemical energy. So obviously the process is photosynthesis that converts light into chemical and uh, this photosynthesis occurs by the obviously chloroplast molecules. They trap the sunlight and then they photosynthesize using carbon dioxide and water to produce their starch molecules. So that's how they convert the light energy into chemical energy. Moving to question number 32, state two ways in which the structure of vein differs from the structure of artery. We know that arteries are have, uh, have a very thick wall and veins have very thin wall. Arteries have very muscular walls and veins have less muscular walls and arteries have high elastic fibers or elastic tissues and veins have less elastic tissues because obviously arteries need to withstand high pressure so they need to have um, re elastic recoiling action they need to perform the elastic recoiling action but for veins they do not have to withstand high pressure so elastic recoiling action is not that much a compulsory point for veins then the last point is the lumen is very narrow for artery and very wide for veins the lumen part is also a very uh, big factor because the arteries intentionally have a very narrow lumen compared to the veins so that they can control the high pressure they can maintain the high pressure as they need to transfer blood over a longer distance so that's why high pressure is kind of a compulsory requirement for them and that's why to maintain that high pressure they always have a narrow lumen Whereas in veins, the lumens are quite wide and big because they do, not, they do not need to transfer blood over a longer distance. And for that reason, they do not also need to maintain high pressure. And that's why they have wider lumens compared to arteries. 
Moving to question number 33, explain the advantage of a withdrawal reflex when a finger touches a hot object. So, advantages of withdrawal reflex means, means basically that in, of involuntary actions. Why involuntary actions are very advantageous? The first thing that it is very fast, so it doesn't cause, cause much damage because, without, because uh, damaging requires time and we're not giving it that much time to cause damage. That means entire fast process reduces the damage, damage of damagement of that specific area. So fast and causes less damage and hurt. And again, withdrawal, of ref uh, withdrawal reflex is an involuntary action, which means that we do not need to involve our brain for these simple actions. For example, um, withdrawing obviously hot, uh, our hand from hot object, breathing during sleeping. While we are sleeping, we still keep on breathing. So that's also an involuntary action. And then question number 34, compare the responses of roots and steam to gravity. So the Marxian points are that that uh, as we are using the term gravity, roots always grow towards gravity, but steam always grow against the gravity. So uh, roots show positive geotrophic effect, and steams go uh, steams show negative geotrophic effect. And compare the responses of roots and steams to light. Now. Here, light grows towards, uh, sorry, stems grow towards light and roots grow away from the light. So here for the light response, stems are showing positive uh, phototrophic effect and roots are showing negative phototrophic effect. Question number 34 is done. Moving to question number 35. Still, what is meant by the following terms? Pesticide, we know it is a chemical that kills or destroys any kind of animals that, is, that will cause harm to our crops. So pesticides are basically chemicals that kill or destroy any kind of animals or insects that feed on plants. And then what is the term, uh, what is the meaning of the term recessive? Recessive means a type of allele that is only expressed in homozygous conditions. They cannot be expressed in heterozygous conditions or in a condition where a dominant allele is present. In that state, the dominant allele would, uh, would, repress, would express itself and the recessive allele will just become as a carrier part. So only expressed in homozygous state and not expressed in heterozygous state. We obviously know what is the meaning for organ. Organ is basically a group of tissues working together, right? A group of tissues performing one simple task is basically organ. And then there's this term for transgenic. Transgenic means that um, we, if we transfer gene, if you transfer a specific gene from one species to another, that means we are making a transgenic species. The species that receives the DNA or a gene or allele from another species, that species becomes transgenic. And polygenic means uh, multiple gene. Ma uh, so many diseases are, we always say that some diseases are polygenic. Polygenic means a disease that is caused by the fault of many genes. So polygenic means uh, for, uh, an entire multiple number of genes are responsible for that specific result. 36. Give two differences in structure between red blood cell and white blood cell. We know that red blood cells are uh, smaller and white blood cells are quite bigger compared to RBC. Red blood cells doesn't have a nucleus because they need to uh, provide space for the hemoglobin but white blood cells always have like nucleuses and uh, red blood cells are biconcave in shape whereas white blood cells are different in shape and red blood cells are formed in the bone marrow and white blood cells are formed in the lymph nodes so these are the differences then question number 37 describe the differences between diffusion and active transport we know diffusion is passive passive means energy is not required and active transport is active that is energy is required for active transport uh, diffusion is through down the concentration gradient that is molecules move from higher concentration to lower concentration but active transport is against the concentration gradient that is in active transport molecules move from lower concentration to higher concentration Active transport requires energy obviously because it is an active process and diffusion is a passive process so it does not require ATP. 
and active transport require membrane obviously active transport need to be carried out inside living cells because only living cells can provide atp molecules for active transport to occur so that's why only in intestine only in roots active transport occur but whereas diffusion diffusion doesn't need any membrane also doesn't need the fact that diffusion need to be occurred inside a living cell it can also occur inside any non-living cell too and diffusion can take place in non-living systems so question number 37 is done moving to question number 38 Explain the factors that affect the rate of movement of substances into and out of cells. So rate of movement of substances into and out of cells, obviously that means that um, entire prostate for diffusion, the factors that actually affect the rate of diffusion, we are just going to use those factors and arrange our answers using those points. So obviously, if we increase the temperature, temperature will increase the kinetic energy of the molecules and molecules will now diffuse at a higher rate and difference in concentration gradient if concentration gradient increases again to, uh, your diffusion rate would increase if the uh, diffusion distance becomes shorter this will also again uh, increase the rate of diffusion and if the particle size is small if a particle size is small that means its surface area is small or its mass is small therefore it can move around very quickly and obviously as it, as it can move around very quickly it, it increases the rate of diffusion and then um, if the particle is uh, charged charged particles cannot diffuse that much easily so charged particles doesn't diffuse easily and after that increased oxygen atp or respiration for active transport obviously you can write your answer in any in, in, in any of the terms so that if you want to answer write your answer for active transport use the factors for active transport if you want to write your answer in in, in terms of oxygen uh, sorry in terms of osmosis then use your factors for osmosis and again if you write want to write your answer for diffusion then you can obviously go for these points that i discussed over in this slide I hope question number 38 is done. Moving to 39, describe the role of chlorophyll. So we know chlorophyll are the main green pigment that absorbs or traps light and this light is needed for the photosynthesis to occur and this photosynthesis produce starch that is required for the plant growth. So chlorophyll plays a very vital role for the entire plant growth. Part 2 describe how to test leaves for, star, uh, for starch safely. So obviously safely means that we are going to place uh, the leaf into boiling water and then again heat it in ethanol and then using um, water bath obviously and then we have to wear safety goggles so that the water heated ethanol or the hot water doesn't spill into our eyes so safety goggles is required and then after all this process we need to add iodine solution to this uh, entirely prepared leaf and if the formation of blue black color occurs this blue black color indicates the presence of starch so with this our 39 ends moving to question number 40 explain why plants store carbohydrate as starch rather than glucose because glucose is a very soluble molecule and starch is insoluble uh, so we can easily store it for a very longer time without it getting it being uh, soluble or dissolved or carried away. So starch is insoluble so we can store it for a very long time. And again as glucose is a very soluble molecule that means it will cause osmotic effect onto the cell. So glucose will cause or change osmotic effect but starch will not so that's why it does not have any osmotic effect on the cell. So question number 40 is done, moving to 41, this, uh, this, uh, what difference between diploid, uh, diploid and haploid. So the differences are that obviously diploid means that the entire cell will have 23 pairs of chromosome, whereas haploid means that the cell will have only 23 chromosomes. Diploid cell contains 46 chromosomes, haploid cells contains only 23 chromosomes half of the chromosomes and uh, haploid has only uh, one chromosome from each pair 
and yeah these are all the factors like diploid has two uh, pairs of each chromosome and haploid has one pair of each chromosome and question number 42 give the role of two named enzymes in the production of gm molecules we know that the two enzymes are restriction enzyme and ligase enzyme restriction enzyme is that is needed to cut the dna at certain sections and ligase enzyme is needed to join the dna so these are the enzymes that are involved for the uh, gm organisms question number 43 describe the function of plasma in transporting named sus uh, substances in the body so obviously it transports glucose from the intestine to the body cells it transports amino acids from the uh, intestine ileum to the uh, required body cells it transports fatty acids uh, to the required uh, cells for their entire uh, for entire function they transport hormones from the endocrine glands to the site of action then urea is transported around the entire body waste waste materials like carbon dioxide is transported and to prevent infection the entire lymphocyte release antibodies into the blood and the blood then carries the antibodies to the site of infection and again uh, your plasma contains fibrinogen fibrinogen causes blood clotting to prevent excessive bleeding so these are the entire uh, functions that the plasma need to play for the transporting mechanism I hope question number 43 was clear. Moving to question number 44. Explain the biological consequences of sewage pollution on a river ecosystem. So the entire biological consequences are that they are pathogenic. Obviously, pathogenic means that they will, they, they will cause a spread of disease. Urea and everything, uh, urea and urine contain nitrates and nitrate will obviously cause eutrophication effect, algae bloom and again decrease in blood uh, or water, ox uh, water oxygen concentration leading to loss of aquatic life and plants and then entire uh, decomposition, decomposition will happen which will again release to uh, or cause to reduction in the oxygen concentration of the plant of the water level causing loss of aquatic life or plants and then uh, the algae bloom also prevents the uh, also blocks the light entry thus the plants inside the water or underneath the water will not get enough light to photosynthesize more and again as the decomposers and the algae are going to respire using the oxygen from the water so less oxygen is available inside the water and which will cause less respiration so death of organisms due to less oxygen availability and therefore biodiversity decreases i hope question number 44 was clear moving to question number 45 explain why a pregnant woman may need to take extra minerals and vitamins vitamin a pregnant woman need to take vitamin a in a quite ex excess amount because it is needed for the formation of the fetus's eye and vitamin c is needed for the formation of fetus's skin vitamin d is needed for the formation of fetus's teeth bone calcium is uh, also absorbed if vitamin d is available so again for the calcium absorption vitamin d needs to be taken inside the pregnant woman and uh, again calcium is needed for the formation of uh, teeth and bones iron is needed for the formation of hemoglobin and phosphate is needed for the formation of dna rna and bones and atp molecules of the fetus so with this our entire repeated question session ends i hope it was clear enough for you all to understand and you will find this entire slide and video very helpful for your exam so all the best for your exams and thank you for watching